Hello everyone, um, my name is Stepan and today I'll be talking to you uh, how to hide your secrets in a vault. Uh, so I work at Infinum, uh, we are based in Zagreb, Croatia and uh, I'm a team lead of a uh, uh, backend team that does mostly Rails. We started to dip our toes into Elixir and Go and we have a sub team uh, of DevOps that handle and maintain our infrastructure. So, who here ha has heard of a 12-factor app? Yeah, some of you have. Uh, for the others, it's uh, like a documentation written uh, by the guys at Heroku. And those guys were directly and indirectly involved with uh, building and maintaining and developing thousands of apps. Uh, so they know what they're doing. And um, it's a methodo methodology of what you should and shouldn't do in your web apps. Um, you can think of it as a guide of how to build a better web services. Uh, it has 12 points, hence the name. And uh, those po points vary on different subjects, like um, how you should use your revision control to store your code, uh, how to deploy and uh, build your applications, and how to treat your logs, and stuff like that. I'm going to focus on chapter 3. That says how you should separate your config from your code. And you might be thinking, why should I do this? My code runs just fine with um, my configs uh, hard-coded. Well, first off, uh, you might be having multiple environments. So you have your development environment, you have your production environment, you have your staging environment. And those environments need to connect to a database, and you're not having the same database for all those environments. So you have multiple usernames and passwords. So you need to separate somehow, separate them somehow. Um, you might need to connect to connect to different services like AWS, S3, or Twitter. And so you need different credentials for different environments. Uh, also, like peppers and salts, uh, you shouldn't be using the same in all of our environments. And if you hard code that in your code, there's going to be a lot of ifs, like a lot of ifs in the code itself, depending on the environment. Uh, second reason, why you might want to separate your config from your code, you might want to make your project open source. And that means that you don't want everybody else to see your config files, your config secrets. And uh, by the way, those uh, the config I mentioned earlier, those are the secrets you're trying to save, trying to hide. Um, OK, so you might want to open source it or even sell it. Uh, like, take a look at GitHub. It's an open source project, uh, GitLab. It's an open source project where you can download it and install it on your own server. And I can't imagine the guys go through all of, the, uh, all of their code and deleting everything before shipping. Um, third reason is that we need to explicitly trust our external services, services like GitHub where we store our code. Um, even though you, you might make your projects private, it, they're stored somewhere that GitHub has access to them, and you need to trust them explicitly if you want to store your, like, or if you want to hard code your uh, secrets. Um, if you're using code checkers, linters, online services, runners, everything that basically downloads, clones your code, and runs it somewhere, you need to trust them as well. And if you're still not convinced, you should separate your secrets and store them somewhere sale, safe. Um, this here is Ryan. He's a WordPress developer, and as he used open source for all his life, he wanted to give something back to the community. And one day, he, um, he, he did that. He open sourced his own little blog project, put it up on GitHub, and he went to bed happily. He was happy for that. Uh, when he woke up, he woke up to a nightmare. So he got an email from Amazon saying that his Amazon account might be compromised. He should take a look at it. 
what he found out is that there were 80 instances of EC2 running on his servers. Um, actually, he didn't check all his regions, and there were like 600 instances of EC2 running. So what happened? Um, there are bots all over the internet, and uh, some of them are specifically targeting GitHub and public projects in, in a way, they're trying to find your secrets, right? And some of those bots are specifically looking for AWS keys, which can, they can exploit and create EC2 instances to mine Bitcoin. And even though Ryan uh, checked before he uh, pushed his commits, and there was a config file that somehow he backed, uh, backed up and which ended up in the revision in, the, in his Git. So it got pushed, everyone could see it, and 16 hours later, he got a $6,000 bill from Amazon. And if you're saying to yourself, yeah, but I'm using my private repositories, that's not gonna happen to me, right? Well, this is Carlo. Uh, he's a .NET developer and as such uses Visual Studio for to do all his coding. And one day he was trying out the, the then new Visual Studio 2015. It, ca it came with all new nifty features. And one of those features was a Git integration. And especially here, a GitHub integration, where you could, uh, from the Visual Studio itself, create your repositories. And he wanted to try that. He created a new private repository with his own, uh, with his own uh, for his own uh, project. And ten minutes later, he got an email from Amazon saying, "You should check. You should take a look at your uh, account. It might be compromised." So what happened? Uh, turned out there was a bug in the GitHub uh, plugin where even though you specifically said to you to create a private repository, you created a public repository. And his uh, Alexa credentials was, were exposed. Um, yeah, he also got a bill, a uh, pretty huge bill for all, all his efforts. Um, the good thing is Amazon is good. <laughs> um, it usually will refund you uh, those kind of um, errors. But you shouldn't, like, um, you shouldn't depend on it. So take away from this, you really should be, like, re really careful with your secrets. Right. So how do you do that? How do you make them safe? First and obvious step is stop hard coding them. So there, are, there is no need and there is no excuse for you to hard code your secrets. And the best thing is put them in uh, environment variables and there are tools for each language that can extract those variables in your code. And there is a tool in every language that can help you with um, specifying secrets per project, per environment, wherever you need. Um, second step is to stop committing that extract secrets file in your uh, repository manager. Um, or else uh, things like uh, the same thing that happened to Ryan and Carlos will probably happen to you. Uh, we tried that as, um, as a test. I created a fake, basically I created a, a user account on, on our Amazon uh, account and we didn't give him any permissions and it took like 10 to an hour t 10 minutes to an hour to for something to for someone to try to happen right um, there are tools to help you with that um, this is a, like um, the git secrets project is a tool which which is a git hook that you install uh, locally and that helps you, that prevents you, in even uh, that warns you and even prevents you from hard coding any strings that might look like a secret. So you extract, you, you stopped hard coding that, uh, hard coding the secrets, you extracted them from your Git or your 
repository of choice, and now your secrets are safe. And now we come, come to the hard part. Um, imagine this scenario. So you start working on a new project, and you're happy because all your secrets are your own, and you don't need to share them with anybody. Then a new developer comes along to help you with your work. Now, there's, you need to find a way to share those secrets, right? Are you going to do them through email, through Slack, through something insecure? Probably, yeah, because you, you, you don't have the time to, to work anything out. But maybe you want to, because you're, uh, using, you're on the same network, you might want to airdrop the files. That's pretty good. And your problem is solved. Now, a third developer comes along. He's a front-end developer. Um, he works remotely. So airdrop here doesn't work. And now you might, you, you're trying to f figure out the best solution. You might want to use Dropbox for this. Um, but let's say a fourth developer comes along and he has some issues with Dropbox and refuses to make an account. So that's the problem. How do you share your secrets with your collaborators? So let's say you shared, you shared your secrets somehow. Now you created your uh, continuous integrations uh, service. Uh, for example, uh, Drivers or Jenkins. I heard you all use, most of you use, use Jenkins here. We use Sanfor. If anybody heard of it, it's cool. Um, so most of the, the, the CI services has a way of handling environment variables. Um, there's probably a web UI where you can enter your variables, and some of them even can be encrypted. Although you don't know that if if it actually is encrypted on the back end, and there's there uh, you know there is a way to decrypt them because your project when uh, when the CI is running tests is using the right environment secrets. So there is an explicit trust here that your CI service won't use your secrets against you. There uh, there's nothing holding them them back, right? Okay. So you move on, and now you need a server, because what's the point elsewhere yeah. otherwise? Um, let's say you chose Amazon, you, cho uh, you created an EC2 instance uh, for your server. Um, you installed the program of your choice. Ours is Ruby, because we mainly do Rails. You deploy your app, create the environment var variables as global variables, and everything's good. Uh, but then you need a new. Uh, application environment, you need like staging. But then you might need uh, another environment like UAT. And, um, so what then? Uh, so then you start, you, you need to uh, deploy more applications on your server. Why shouldn't, why shouldn't one server handle more applications, right? Then you do a Java application. And let's throw a Phoenix application just for good measure. Um, there are ways in in Linux uh, to handle the, to separate the environment variables easily. Uh, let's say each application can, can have its own user and its own environment variables. Uh, if you're using something like Nginx uh, for your uh, web server, um, there's a way, there, there are ways to encode those secrets directly into the config files of Nginx. But we're trying to find something uh, simple and uh, secure to share our secrets. So the uh, humans, the developers, and machines can uh, use the same thing and work in harmony. So what are our options? First and obvious choice is something like Dropbox, uh, Google Docs. You create your own uh, VPS just to store those secrets. Uh, but there is a problem here because even if you use something like Dropbox, those secrets are not encrypted. And you want to encrypt it before storing them somewhere because if somebody gets hold of your Dropbox, they can read it. So there's a new problem here. Even though you encry uh, encrypt your secrets before storing them on something like this, um, you need to find a way to share the master key for the encryption. Or if you're using um, something like Puppet or Chef, uh, similar, some, some like Ansible, um, 
Chef has encrypted data bags, Puppet has encrypted Hiera, and so on. Each of those um, managers has a way to, to store, to, to handle secrets. But uh, there's still a problem of um, sharing th that master key that they are uh, using to encode those secrets. Of course, Amazon has its own services like uh, KMS, in, and even though um, KMS is more, more, more focused on storing the master keys, the encryption keys for uh, the crypto, your cryptogra uh, cryptographic uh, uh, operations. Recently, they announced and released something called System Manager Parameter Store, um, which is basically a store that can store arbitrary key value, uh, key value um, keys. And uh, it's using KMS to decrypt and encrypt them. And as with all Amazon services, it's more, um, it's primarily intended to be used with other Amazon services. So we move from that. Um, there's a new thing called Confident. Uh, the uh, developers at Lyft created this. It uses KMS for encryption and uses DynamoDB for storing the secrets. Um, it's something new, we haven't tried it yet, but it's young and it might be something to look, to look out for. Okay, now we come to the big guns. Um, Kiwis is a tool built by the guys at Square. Uh, it's a complete secrets management solution. It runs in Java, it has a CLI and a web UI. It uses a Fuse-based file system uh, and a TLS for authentication. And um, when we did our first like uh, R&D, uh, we skipped over Kiwis because the next option, the next solution was better suited for us. And at last we come to Vault, the, the thing we're here for. Um, who he here has heard of Vault? Um, it's built by the guys at HashiCorp, and if you don't know them, uh, they built Vagrant and Console, so they know what they're talking about. So what is Vault? Vault is a tool uh, that's written in Go, and it can be used to store arbitrary key value secrets. And it's secure because it stores them, um, because it doesn't trust any storage backend that you choose. Um, so it encrypts those secrets before storing them. Um, and even though somebody breaks your uh, database, uh, they're just going to get gibberish. Um, for encryption, they use an uh, a AES cipher with the Galeos counter mode. And the uh, master key sharing is, I think, done in a cool way. So when you uh, so Vault uses an algorithm called uh, Shamir secret sharing. So it creates a master key and then it splits it into shards. So during uh, when you initialize your Vault, um, it creates the master key and splits into something called unsealed keys. And this is the first and only time you're going to see all your keys in one place. So you should distribute them uh, to the developers you trust, to the people you trust. And every time Vault it starts or it restarts, it starts in a sealed mode. So you need to unseal it um, because if it's in a sealed mode, uh, sealed mode, the Vault can read from the database, from the backend, but it doesn't know how to decrypt the secrets. So you need to unseal it. And to unseal the, vo the Vault with the Shamir, uh, Shamir secret sharing, you need to have a threshold number of keys. So for this example, we created five unsealed keys and the key threshold is three. So that means that if you want to unseal the vault, you need to have at least three keys for it to be unsealed. And um, that's good. That's kind of cool. Um, also, you, you can see here uh, the initial pro uh, process generates a root token. So that's, a, uh, that's the token that you should be using only for initialization and uh, initial setup and probably throw it away later uh, because it can do anything and I mean anything. So you don't want to use that. So where can Vault uh, store your secrets? There are many, many 
um, backends to choose from. These are just some of them. Um, you also want, want to somehow uh, authenticate your users. Um, here I can um, uh, like point out GitHub because th that's the, the, the one reason we, we chose Vault over Kiwis. And it's a, it has a cool feature that you can enable to factor authentication, which I think is cool. Um, also, you need, need a way to log uh, the usage of your Vault. You want to see what users, what your users are doing. Uh, there are not a lo lot of options here, but this should be fine. This should be enough, and you can even uh, pipe it into something like uh, Elasticsearch or Elk Stark or uh, Greylog. So, among um, there are other features Vault has. One of those are is dynamic secrets. So you can Vault can generate um, on-demand secrets for some systems like AWS. It can create um, key, uh, AWS key pair and it uh, adds, um, it initializes them with a lease. So you can use the, the key pairs for something you want and let's say after an hour, it just re revokes them. So you can do that on the fly. Uh, it does data encryption, which means uh, that it can encrypt and decrypt data without storing them. Um, you can also look at it as cryptography as a service. We haven't find a way, found a way for to use that, but I'm sure some of you will. Uh, it also does leasing and renewal of secrets. It does token revocation, yeah, all you need, right, uh, for your enterprise uh, secret management to be complete. Uh, it also has a pro and enterprise editions. Uh, it adds a web UI, it adds some uh, health dashboards, backups and stores. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you that because it's, you have to request permission. You have to request from the, uh, f uh, for the guys to, to give you access and we still haven't done that. So yeah, uh, now I'm gonna show you how, to, how it's easy to install Vault on your server. So, um, Vault comes in only one flavor. It's a binary um, file that you can download from their uh, server. And it, uh, it has binaries for all the major OSs, including FreeBSD, Solar, Solaris, and um, of course, Windows, Windows and Mac. And you get that single binary, you put it in a well-known path, and it contains the client and the server. So there's no separation here. Um, you also need to choose your backend where you want to store your secrets. Uh, here we choose console, and this is a simple configuration of Vault, everything you need to do for Vault to be running. So you choose a backend, and you list listeners where you want the Vault to listen for the API requests. And this here, even though it looks like JSON, isn't JSON. It's a H HCL or HashiCorp configuration language. I don't know why the guys made that, why they didn't just use JSON, because it's a superset of JSON. But hey, it works and it's pretty uh, easily readable. Uh, so now you have your configuration, you start the server using that config file and your service is running, right? This is the part of the, uh, the, the server part of the binary. Um, so now that the, service is, uh, the server is running, you need to initialize them. We went over that already. You need to unseal it. This is the process. You enter one keys, it increases the progress count, and so on uh, until you uh, enter at least three. The cool part here is that it remembers which. Excuse me. It remembers the progress. So if even though if you enter wrong key just will say until progress one. So that's cool. Um, so, but uh, before you can use it, before you can store and read uh, secrets, you need to uh, somehow authenticate yourself to the vault that you are the user who, who, who has the uh, authorities, who has the pre uh, authorities to, to do that. So we here uh, enable GitHub as a authentication backend. Um, the default backend it uses for uh, authentication is simple token authentication, so you can use your root uh, uh, token out of the uh, 
out of the box. And here we, um, we map um, organization on GitHub called Awesome Corp to our vault, which means that anybody uh, who's in our organization uh, can use vault. And that's cool because, um, um, okay, I'll, I'll come to that later. And final thing, uh, final key uh, keyword I need to introduce you to is policies. So here we have a simple policy. So anybody who has that policy associated with them uh, can read and write on path to secrets path. So that path is arbitrary. You can put anything there. And uh, anybody who has that policy with it can read and write from that path. Uh, and you have a policy, you created the policy, you have to map it to something. So we mapped our dev policy to a team on GitHub called dev team. So that's a team in our awesome corp uh, organization on GitHub. So everybody, uh, each person, so he here's the cool part. So um, when you create a project, you create, you map these policies, right? Your DevOps guy uh, creates these policies, maps all, all he needs to map. And then you just need to drag and drop to add, you need to add persons, the developers who need to use those secrets in a GitHub team. And he just has access to, to those secrets. And there's an added benefit here. If somebody, if some developer is gonna leave your company, you know in each, uh, where, uh, in each uh, team he, uh, he was in, and you just need to regenerate those secrets. You don't have to regenerate all of them. So that's cool. Uh, and before we can read and write from Vault, of course, you need to authenticate yourself. Uh, you, get, you generate a token on GitHub and use a method uh, GitHub to authenticate yourself. And here we see that uh, you're authenticated and you're given a token. So your, uh, all your next reads and writes are using this token. And that token has a, a duration lease. So when the duration expires, your token is no longer valid. And there are policies associated with that token. So this token can only read and write from uh, default policy and dev policy. And now you can write and read. Whew. But really is uh, pretty simple and it's fast to, to start it up. Uh, so here we have, uh, we see that, um, so there's vault read and write. You write to a uh, path, I explained earlier, you read to path, and you write uh, arbitrary key value uh, values. So we, uh, he, uh, here we are going to store foo equals bar, so foo is key, bar is value, to a path to secrets path, and everybody who has access to it can read from that, and they're gonna get foo bar, right? So here's a, here's a workflow. Uh, to better like visualize, visualize. So, uh, developer goes to GitHub, gets his GitHub token, and then does a Vault out to authenticate himself with Vault. Vault then asks GitHub, uh, "What? <laughs> I can see here. Uh, what team uh, is that user in?" Uh, GitHub responds with something like this. So he's in those uh, teams. Then Vault look in his own policies to see which policies are associated with that uh, with those teams he gets back an array of policies and you get a token back that's associated with those policies and now that you have a token uh, you're going to read and write uh, so here we try, we're trying to read from path to secret uh, Paul then goes into policy sees if that token has a read permission on that path and if yes it's going to decrypt the secrets, and it's gonna give those secrets back to the user. Any question on this? No, cool. So here we have the, our uh, image from before, where we can see now that our users, all of our developers can read and write from Vault, uh, and our servers and our CI services mainly only need to do reads. So before each build, you need to find out, if, uh, you need to read, you need to download the secrets. And before every deploy, you need to download the, se the secrets so uh, your app can run. 
Okay, so I'm gonna show you. Um, so here's the thing. Um, as I said before, those parts, paths are arbitrary, so they can be anything you want. Um, okay, not everything you can't write to sys because sys is um, it's a part where Vault stores his uh, configs, but anything el else is acceptable. So how are you gonna communicate with your uh, colleagues and your servers where those secrets are stored? Uh, I mean, the logical explanation here, you can just write in readme, but we at Infinum are working with hundreds of projects and naming convention is a must here. So we use something like this. So the, the first part of the path is technology. So let's say Rails. Uh, the second part of the path is a Git repository name. Um, mainly because it's a name associated with your project, which doesn't change. And once once it's initialized, it usually doesn't change, right? So let's say it's an awesome app. And the last path of the path, last part of the path uh, is environment because you have multiple environments. So let's say production. And now we know that uh, in that awesome app project, there are, uh, there are secrets stored in production development and staging, and everybody knows where they should look, right? I mean, you can still write them in README, but to, because it kind of is a tedious, somehow tedious to remember all what you need to do, uh, that you need to authenticate before you can read and write. Of course, we did a little open source tool for that. It's called Secret CLI. Um, it's a Ruby gem because we do Ruby, um, and it uses the official uh, Vault Ruby client, um, and uh, it simplifies your workflow for the projects. So it has three uh, main commands. The first one is init, where you in, in your project you run uh, secrets in it and creates a simple config file. We just uh, says uh, what file you want to store in secrets in Vault and which path you're going to store it in. Um, you might notice the last part is missing because we assume it's an environment. It loads that from uh, your environment. Uh, and of course, that, that's, that secret config file you're going to store in Git because nothing really is written there. There are no secrets here, but uh, your servers and your other developers need to know where they are stored. Uh, so exactly there's a uh, secrets push, where you push your um, secrets. Um, we did this diff thing because uh, Vault doesn't have versioning of your secrets. Um, and there's a GitHub issue for it, but they said that not, they're probably not going to implement it because it's hard. So we did this like diff. Um, check before you actually, they are actually stored so you don't override something crucial. And you might have noticed there's no authentic authenticate here. So each of those push and pulls does authenticate before it. So it's totally hidden from you. So you don't have to remember that. Yeah. And you pull from them, from the secrets. And basically, that's it. That's fault. So um, as I said earlier, I'm from Infinum. We do. We are in the, uh, we are independent design and development agency. More than 100 of us. We do some other cool stuff, so you can check us out. And that's it. Are there any questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you uh, beside your uh, beside your application, you install, it, let's say you're using our workflow with secrets, right? Or even with Vault. You need to install Vault uh, on your server. Let's say you're using secrets because it's an easier example. So you, uh, beside uh, your uh, app, you need to install the secret. So it's just gem install secrets CLI. And then you just do secrets pull because in your Git, um, Git files, there's a, there's a config file that secrets can read. And he knows uh, if you specify the, uh, you're going to specify which environment production 
uh, you're going to use, it just downloads the file directly on the server where your application can read it. No, it's not, uh, because you have your uh, script, you have your builds, right? You have your scripts which build your projects. Uh, uh, we use Rails, so we do all our scripting. On the, we, we use a script tool that um, just uh, clones our Git and does some blinking. And in the middle of that, it pulls from, from Vault, the secrets from Vault. If you, I don't know how, exactly how Java is built, but before you, you build it in your jar, I suppose you're going to uh, download the, the secret somewhere on the server where that jar can read it. Uh, no, yes. That's, yeah, that's right. Uh, you need... Um, I mean, you can do it either way. Uh, you can do this uh, before you compile your app, right, on your local machine. You can uh, pull, for uh, example, Elixir is a... So it's a compiled language. Uh, when we build our application, Let's say on a, we have a CI server that builds our application, right? The CI server uh, does the uh, pulls the uh, pulls the file from from Vault, and it compiles everything in it and just pushes the artifact on the server. Or if you're using something like Rails where you don't have to compile anything, you can just do that everything on the server, and it's automatic every time. You just need to add somewhere there. You need to add a line which says pull from Vault. Or, sorry, or if you want, um, yeah, yeah, that's basically it. Um, I mean, you can. This is one example of its use of its usage. You can. Uh, there, there are um, many more clients for Vault. I think there's a Java client for Vault, and you can actually hard code the downloading part of secrets in your application if you want. Right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, there's a, so there are tools to help you with that, basically. Um, there's a sorry. Um, so the question here is uh, the listening part of the of the vault. Does it have to be accessed externally or internally? Uh, basically, that depends on your usage. You can install vault directly on the server that your application is running. Then it can be only internally. But um, we set it up so it can be uh, accessed from the outside. So each of our server, which are who knows where, can access it. Uh, no. Uh, so you can have a cluster of vaults. And there, um, there are, you can um, put multiple uh, listeners on them. And also, um, there, there is a um, Vault promises you a high availability uh, feature. So if you're using something like a console, so you can have a cluster of consoles and a cluster of vaults to uh, handle your requests. You can have a like I don't know nginx behind it uh, before it, and it can load balance your requests because at the end it writes in the same database. Okay. Yeah. If you have such a cluster of vaults, you have to initialize or uh, not initialize them. Um, unseal. Un unseal yes. Yes. Every every server needs to be unsealed before it can be used. Crashes and it 
Yeah, unfortunately, yes. So the question was, if one of those vaults, uh, vault service fa fails or crashes, when it starts up, it starts in a sealed mode, and you to, you need to go there manually to unseal it. That's the secret. That's the secure part of vault. You don't want some kind of a, a random power failure to give it access to to everything else, right? Anything else? Any more questions? Cool. Yeah, that's it then. Thank you for your time.